Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfill your potential. Welcome to episode 18, and I am here with the lovely Andrea Downey from Project Thrive. And Andrea is a former primary classroom teacher and school leader of well-being, learning enhancement, technology, gifted education, and a former deputy principal. And she's now moved out of the classroom, but continues to teach now largely to grown-ups and grown-up professionals on topics including personalizing learning, metacognition, well-being science, neuroscience, and the application of positive psychology in education. And she's here to tell us about a her teaching work, her passion for wellbeing and education, and about Project Thrive. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. I'm very honoured to be here. I'm glad you're here because I've got lots of questions for you. (laughs) And I want to kick off by asking, what is Project Thrive? So Project Thrive is a purpose-driven organisation, which we co-founded in 2016. And we're working with schools, communities, um, and organisations now as well, basically creating ecosystems of well-being um, and the key word being there is co-creating them with those. So not going in and necessarily you know, telling them what they should be doing or how they could be doing it, but bringing the science, I guess, of um, positive psychology and a number of different fields to actually help them to co-create it. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to create systems in education, communities and organisations where people have those conditions where they can optimally function or be at their best whilst contributing to the world around them. So what does that look like in a practical sense? What what would that mean, say, perhaps in a school that you're working with? So uh, within a school, we would go in and we would work with staff. So it's always over a period of time. Uh, A lot of it starts initially with maybe inspiration. So it's sharing knowledge or, or sharing the science of wellbeing and how we confuse that with education practices. But then we also lead them through what I would call a systems approach where we get them to really reflect on the purpose of education, uh, why we why we educate, uh, and bring them back to the core and the heart of it, I guess, getting them to then set intentions together around how they could potentially or what they want to get out of um, co-creating. And then there's always an inspiration phase where we will go and look at uh, either ideas or get inspiration from other schools or see what other people are doing and, and how that's worked. And then there's a co-creation phase that we go into next with them where it's all about implementing. So almost about implementing a strategic plan, but one that they're very much being a part of and one that doesn't become one that's filed in the drawer, but, uh, you know, is really lived within the school and, and you can see is, is being lived and breathed that becomes an approach. Okay. So I can see where that kind of purpose-driven idea comes in there, starting out with that big why question. Why are mm-hmm. we here? What is our purpose? What is our role, I guess, as educators and schools? What's the purpose of education? And then yeah. trickling down to some more practical and implementation bits. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because we initially set out just to work with schools. So that was very clear in our strategy when we launched Project Thrive. But then what kind of happened over time is we, we realised the more that we were working with schools, the more that we actually had to branch out into organisations as well. So it actually came about, was doing a parent night with a school I'd been working extensively with and a father of one of the students came up at the end. It's always great. We always get lots of mums and dads at, at these, these talks. And the father came up at the end and said, I really need you to come and um, talk within my organisation. Would you do that? And it challenged my thinking because it was something that, you know, we'd kind of set out deliberately and strategically not to do. But I very quickly realized that if we're going to create ecosystems of well-being, then we actually do need to work within, you know, those workplaces too. And I only learned that after going out into this father's workplace. It was probably one of the most impactful experiences that I'd ever had because I was very apprehensive. I was uh, thinking, you know, am I going to have any impact here? But in actual fact, that situation turned out for one of the employees of that organization to be a potentially life 
you know, saving situation. A lot of things came out of that. And it just made me reflect on the things that, you know, yeah, we always think of the students, but the things the teachers are experiencing and even more so the things the parents are experiencing completely impact on that child. So then it made sense for us to start working with some of the parents' workplaces as well. Um, I've also just got back from working with a lot of mothers of students that we work with in a retreat over in Indonesia as well. So it's it's branched out in many different ways that we first didn't intend it to. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I think for me, it often comes back because I know what you mean about having to go into places where you just think, oh, this is outside of my comfort zone or this is outside of my ordinary experience. Do yeah. I know what I'm doing? And yeah. I, the thing that I cling to, which I think you kind of articulated there, is just that, you know, we are all human and all of these bits interrelate you know how how things work at home touches on how things work at school and vice versa how things work at work for parents has an impact on how we are and how we operate and how we interact with our kids and yeah you can't kind of tease it apart really you know it is absolutely everything's interconnected and I guess that's one of the biggest things we consider in our approach that it's not just looking at working with, you know, the individual. It's looking at if we're talking about true ecosystems, it's about how everything's interconnected. So it's, yeah, one of one of the biggest focuses we have, I guess, in the work. Mm. And one of the exciting things about positive psychology, I think, as well, isn't it? It's kind of moving away in many ways from that one-on-one individual approach that we might think of in terms of classical mm-hmm. psychology or therapeutic stuff and yep. really starting to look at these bigger, you know, I know when, when Martin Seligman, you know, first started talking about positive psychology and he talked about the individuals, but also about schools and workplaces and communities as being yes. part to cre- a part of, you know, all the places to create this kind of flourishing and thriving. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a it's a really key part, and the research and the work is certainly starting to to branch out and, and focus more on that area, which is really exciting. I think we're going to see some fantastic things come from that. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. And when you talk about we, who are we? So there's you. Who else is yeah. part of Project Drive? <laughs> so there's myself, and I co-founded it with Nell Golden, who I studied the masters with as well. Um, We also have a couple of facilitators that step in and help out. So uh, Dr. Emily Hill, she does a fair bit of work with us. She's a Geelong-based psychologist and she's worked at a practice um, in Geelong for a number of years where they heavily use positive psychology. So she does some facilitation work with us, which is fantastic. We also have, so uh, Michael Cargreg is a bit of an advisor to us. So it's really great to have, you know, that balance of people who, although I've studied psychology I'm not a psychologist so it's very important that we're balancing that with having that that expert knowledge there as well and then we've got a number of other peers and colleagues that we work heavily with as well which is fantastic so it kind of branches out to working with others who are doing similar things and and enjoy similar passions. So you have your own ecosystem there. Yeah (laughs) yeah yeah you could say that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've told us a little bit about schools and I'm going to ask you in a, in a little while about your work recently in Indonesia and, and some of the cool stuff that was going on there. Mm-hmm. From a parent's perspective, I suppose, you know, I've got two kids in primary school and I know yeah. positive psychology is starting to become far more, I don't know if prevalence the word, but certainly, you know, in, you know more attractive. <laughs> more attractive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and starting to become a, a thing in school. Yeah. So from a parent's perspective, and I know you're a parent as well, although not yet at the mm-hmm. school. Yeah. No, not yet. No, it's yeah. early days, not quite yeah. to the school. Yeah. What is it that you feel that this really offers kids as they grow? Yeah, look, I think it's interesting. I think it's it's something that I consider a lot and ensure that what I'm doing actually is having an impact. And I think it's about how you use the science that's most important. But I guess for me, I take the science and I try and turn it into conditions that create optimal functioning for others. So having the research there, and there's so much fantastic research and so much great knowledge, people working really hard in the field to you know, come up with with ways that we know actually help people to thrive, I guess it's taking that science and turning it into conditions. So for me, it's not so much about the emphasis of teaching others about positive psychology in schools or teaching it to students. It's about creating those conditions that actually support um, students to thrive. So yeah, I guess that's probably for me the biggest thing that it will bring. Having that knowledge, we, we, know, we know some of those conditions and then we can actually cultivate them. So we talk about shifting the paradigm of education and that's kind of disrupting education a bit for me. So looking at, well, how do we currently educate? What is the purpose of it? 
And there's some schools just that are a phenomenal example of, you know, they're living and breeding positive psychology, some of them without even intentionally knowing they're doing it. And it's working for those students. You know, they're creating authentic learning experiences. The learning is experiential. So the UJ Monia, the meaning and purpose is there because those students are so engaged. They're so on task. They're so globally minded. And I, yeah, I think that's, that's the core for me. Okay. And what are some of those conditions? Because I think I have a sense of what I know for uh, the primary school that my children go to is very values driven. I, I've never heard the term positive psychology used, a few bits and pieces like growth yeah. mindset, but, um, yeah. like, and it is, a, and this is what I'm imagining part of what you mean by conditions is, you know, there you can see that those values of mm. community and excellence and respect and, the yeah. other one that I can't remember right now, yeah. <laughs> they are in every interaction between every staff member. They're, they're in every interaction between with every student, with parents. Um, you can just yeah. kind of feel it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you walk in and you can see it live in action, that's when you know it's working. That's when you know it's really transformed and it's, you know, cultivating those conditions. So some of the conditions I think about, absolutely, you're right on focusing on values, not having it be something on the wall, but something that's lived and breathed. The way we educate too, so the opportunities that we provide for students. So moving from that model of perhaps just, you know, sitting and, and doing work at a desk, but actually using the space around us and actually engaging students in real life learning. For me, meaning and purpose, particularly in Australia, I think that eudaimonia is lacking. I think we see it more in um, developing countries. I think we've become, you know, a little bit more about chasing, you know, positive emotions, which are so important, but that hedonic treadmill we talk about where, you know, we, we kind of want those quick fixes of pleasure and we're missing that meaning and purpose. And I think when we create real life learning experiences for students, when we get them engaged in their work, when we set up conditions or great pedagogical practices that allow them to feel purpose in their work, then I think that that's, you know, half the battle that's connecting them in. The schools do have with amazing examples of this, um, the Green School in Indonesia, which I'll tell you about shortly. It was also really interesting. I was having a conversation with the principal that, of a school that we work with and she was having a chat with some of the students and they were talking about free-ranged chickens and caged chickens. And one of the students put her hand up and asked um, the principal, are we free ranged or are we caged? <laughs> Thinking about the classroom situation. And she said it was the most just, you know, insightful question she'd ever been asked and it made her stop and think. So then they went and did this whole activity in the classroom where they measured the classroom and looked at space per person, calculated how long they spend in each inside the four walls each day and, you know, made it their own hypothesis and everything. And they concluded these, you know, young, young primary school students that they were actually caged. How so I think, yeah, kind of sad, but also very insightful. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really scary thought. So I think if we can, yeah, use the science effectively and then create conditions that you know allow children to be at their best, then I think in the long term that's actually going to cultivate well-being as well. Yeah, it's such an interesting discussion, isn't it? I know I was kind of involved in a conversation recently where we were talking about technology in schools and, you know, the fact that every child was giving a laptop or an iPad or mm-hmm. that kind of thing and then expected to, in this particular example, um, kind of sit and work with the technology and there seemed to be a, a limit in the amount of interaction with even the teacher, let alone other kids. And mm-hmm. I can see, I, I know there's, and I, I've actually spoken to one of our other guests about the future of technology and education and policy and all mm-hmm. of how that fits together. Mm-hmm. But what struck me when I was thinking about the school that my children go to is, and I know because I know the science and so I know how important this stuff is, yes. but when I see the things that they learn, sure, they're learning to read and write and do the things that they need to do and the curriculum is there, but so much of what is learning, I think particularly in primary school age to me, is watching them interact in the playground and mm-hmm. climb and run and play sports and do those yeah. sorts of things. You know, you can just see that that's where a lot of the learning is going on, which is yeah. free range, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's crucial. You know, there's a, a national inquiry at the moment into the use of mobile phones um, in schools as well because teachers often report that's a big issue, particularly in secondary where you, know, you can see students at lunchtime and recess. You can see those students who mightn't be engaging with each other but are on their phones. Well, and I think technology certainly has a place. 
Mm. I think, you know, it brings us closer to those who are far away, but it's driving us further and further apart from those that are right next to us. And I think Mm. we need to be really mindful of that. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So tell us a bit about Indonesia. You've been there recently as part of a, a program. Tell us what it was and how it worked. Yeah, well, it was really exciting. It's probably one of um, my projects to date that you really get energy from and you really go, wow, there's potentially some um, some incredible things could happen out of this because of the amazing work that this group did. But it was it's a number of schools that I'm partnered with in the Geelong network. So uh, the Geelong Catholic Primary Schools network, there's 18 schools um, in, within that network and we're working with ongoing a large number of those but I'm also working with the principals of those schools. So that principal group, we, after a couple of years of basically using a lot of the positive psychology research to address, you know, not only principal wellbeing, because we know how um, how that's really being impacted on at the mm-hmm. moment for a number of reasons, but also looking at what they're doing in their schools. Uh, so we did a lot of work around positive psychology. We did a lot of work around their story of self us now. So looking at building relationships um, building, you know, a, a culture that was going to create optimal functioning. We kind of um, led that journey on from the idea of a couple of the fantastic execs in that network to actually go over and be do some systems work together, but be exposed to a fantastic school um, over in Orbord called the Green School. So this school, uh, in my opinion, is probably just one of the schools that is getting so many things right at the moment in terms of how they've shaken up education. And I've been following it since it opened in 2008. And that was the year I actually started teaching. And they used a whole systems approach to basically set that school up. And when you go there, it's really interesting. You can see every element of positive psychology in action. Um, But as I said earlier, they were one of the ones that haven't deliberately uh, drawn on that science I think they just perhaps have got the knowledge from many different places so although they don't explicitly they don't call it positive education they don't you know necessarily say it's the, the application of POSAC you can see it in action so we went over for a week and we went through a process of basically that I facilitated and this was all about co-creation but a big part of that journey was for them to be immersed in what's happening uh, within the green school. So seeing their authentic learning experiences, talking to their students, doing even connecting activities themselves. So we had these principals in a mud pit together, <laughs> which is a very traditional um, Balinese almost kind of self-defense dance thing, but it's all about connection. It's all about spirituality. So it's about connection with self, with others and with nature. And to see the transformation even within that moment of having that group there playing you know almost doing things that we do when we're young but we tend to knock out of children as they get older all out of ourselves so they were back to just being immersed in 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 mud doing those things but also I guess one of the beautiful things of the green school is not only are they creating well-being for students and it's an international school we've got lots of Australian students go over there to study as well that perhaps might not be fitting in here or may there might even be mental health concerns anything at all but just get attracted by how globally minded the school is. So the well-being aspect is really amazing, but also these children are doing so well, Alan. So they're finishing at the green school and universities are chasing them. They're achieving highly, but basically they're educating completely different to how we're educating uh, in Australia. So it's interesting for them to see that and be immersed in that. So they set their intentions together. We do a lot of mindfulness. We do a lot of deep thinking. We do a lot of reflection on the field. We reflect on how we're educating as well back home. And, you know, a lot of people can go into those situations thinking that we're doing everything well or we're doing everything right. But this group was so open-minded and, you know, really ready for the immersion. And after being immersed in the green school, they knew it wasn't about picking up the green school and bringing it back here but it was about being inspired to see the possibilities of, well, how can we actually disrupt our education system a little bit? What could we potentially do? Then we finished the week with a co-creation phase where they all came up with uh, long-term goals, quick wins. What are they going to co-create? How will they do it? How will we bring this experience back to the schools in Geelong? And then from there, they've just been all implementing just fantastic initiatives. So it's been their own work, and they're just inspired. They're, they're doing phenomenal things. So it's been really exciting for me to see. And it was only yesterday I spoke to three of the principals that got in contact to tell me more things that their students are doing, which has really been fantastic to see them inspired, 
Mm. and bringing back all these ideas. One of the principals actually that is retiring at the end of the year, she actually got very emotional and said, you know, for the first time, like, I want to stay in this job for another 20 years. It's all I wish I had now. So to see, a whole to see new yeah, a whole new picture. So really inspiring and that yeah, their work that they're doing is just phenomenal. It's very exciting for the future yeah. of education. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I watched a little video on YouTube about this, the little story of, of these principals who are um, Fantastic. You know, there. And I mean, what struck me about it was, because I sort of thought, oh, yeah, this will be, you know, learning about this and learning about that. But it, it wasn't. Yeah. It was really a much more experiential from that than yes. that. You know, they, they were, I saw them in the mud pit. That kind of looked like yeah. fun. But also, <laughs> you know, walking, sharing, doing activities, doing the things that you might imagine they would get the kids to do but there they are doing it themselves and and it struck me for two reasons one because I thought oh that's not what I expected of school principals (laughs) and neither did they no I can imagine (laughs) and two it really brought home for me the fact that a lot of what we do in positive psychology and positive education all of these fields you really do have to live it and breathe it you know it it really is the doing of it It, it's all very well to know the science and to know the theory but it is actually the practice of it and the bit of mindfulness around that you know the reflecting on what did that feel like how did that inspire me how do I you know how did that affect me in terms of my energy levels or my productivity or any of those sorts of things yeah kind of really came home to me as well watching that that video it looked like a blast it it looked like a lot of fun it's good and even for me to step back and you know really play just the role of facilitator again for me it's about cultivating conditions for others to lead learn thrive and I could I could see that you could actually see that transformation taking place within that week Mm. so it was just such a it was a really emotional energetic amazing experience to be a part of because often you don't necessarily get to see that explicitly you know the result of that that co-creation that you, you're working on or, or what you're actually aiming for so it was mm. fantastic to see yeah. that transpire so you're truly facilitating there aren't you rather than say teaching yeah. stuff it is facilitating Absolutely. a process yeah. that allows people to discover and learn and come up with their own ideas and then kind of run yeah. with them yeah and lead yep absolutely mm. Mm. Yep. And that leadership piece too, that because, you know, I have a background in workplace psychology and a lot of what I'm doing is working with leaders about the role and the importance of leadership and their behavior and also their well-being, you know, because it has an absolute trickle down effect, doesn't it? You know, school principals are, are there to lead the school and they've got a huge responsibility in terms of the staff, but also the students. And unless they are well <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. happy and engaged you know that yeah. does I see it in leaders in in other types of organizations it just has such an impact on their day-to-day yeah. behavior that then flows on to the behavior and experience of everyone around them yeah absolutely and look I think principals are getting a really bad rap at the moment I think that a lot of them are getting really knocked around so some that I've worked with they have so much passion to go into this job and and do what they do and I think sometimes we put a lot of pressure from the outside onto them. And I know some principals that I've worked with that have left the job because of that or just are taking out. leave, because uh, are totally mm. burning out. And mm. I worry about that because that's counterproductive for what we're trying to do. For, if we want to create the best for students, you know, going in and getting aggressive with the principal and things like that is completely counteractive to actually creating great conditions for students too. I think that's something we all need to be a lot more mindful about. Absolutely. Mm, yeah. I, I don't think it's a common conversation that we have in, even in workplaces. I don't think we really think about that impact, that role yeah. modeling that a senior person has, a leader has in terms of even their day-to-day behavior and how much they enjoy their work and how that influences positively or negatively yeah. in everyone else around them and therefore the whole system. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. No, I completely agree. It's a really big one. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. So, so many interesting things that you're doing there. Now, <laughs> what is it? Because because your background is in education and we've talked a lot about that and you started out as a teacher yourself. What yeah. drew you to this field, to doing something different? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. So I guess my background really is a really big fusion of things. So my undergrad, I studied psych, anthropology and sociology uh, and then went on to do education because I always wanted to teach, but I was always really interested in um, 
psychology as well. Mm-hmm. And then obviously went on to do the master's in post psych. So it is a real fusion, which I guess that's why I've always seen through things through a systems lens and never really just relied on one field, um, you know, to, to do anything, but to acknowledge lots of different fields and then how they all fuse together. And that's why I love the work of, um, Dan Siegel. It was actually the, the beautiful Joe Mitchell that introduced me to Dan Siegel's work on interpersonal neurobiology. And I'm a really big fan of his work because I think he, he really does fuse fields together really well to create conditions for people to thrive. So I guess when I was teaching and I felt, I do feel like I was born to teach. It's the job I love the most. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I miss being in the classroom every day, but now I get to work with lots of different schools. So I have to look at the positives there. <laughs> Reframe it a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when I, I was uh, teaching and I guess I always wanted to continue my work with psychology but I was mindful to it of the time and perhaps the course that I was in was very mental illness focused. And um, so I made a very conscious decision to work in education. And then it was one of my mentors that I worked with at the school I was teaching at. She actually came into me one day with an article from the University of Melbourne alumni magazine. And she said, you need to read this article. This is you, you know, this is you to a T. And so I read it and it just really excited me. I thought, it's fantastic. It was about optimal functioning. I think it was called the pursuit of happiness. And I then engaged with, you know, University of Melbourne and and applied for the masters and got in, which is fantastic. I know that Pollyannaism is a really dirty word in in positive (laughs) psychology and people avoid it at all costs. But despite all the adversities, like I I'm so happy to admit and that, you know, I was a bit of a Pollyanna growing up, like a very optimistic thinker. And I think they're the things that perhaps have, you know, got me through times of adversity. Um, I know it's dangerous to be over optimistic, <laughs> overly optimistic, but, you know, Pollyanna had her injury and she acknowledged the negative emotions <laughs> as well. But I did love that movie growing up. And I can remember in the master sitting there for the two years and every time that they got very defensive about Pollyannaism or, you know, the happyology part, I'd just sit quietly and <laughs> pretend I agreed. And yeah, yeah. But <laughs> that's so interesting because I remember one of the first, I, I have a background in doing lots of work in um, personality testing and, and psychometric, yeah. that kind of thing. And one of the first personality tests that I did as part of my training and I was being debriefed and yeah. I come out very high on optimism. <laughs> Good. So I've got and I remember one. the guy who was debriefing it was kind of like, yeah. well, of course, you know, there's all sorts of problems associated with yeah. being too optimistic and too Pollyanna-ish. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, really? Do you really <laughs> think so? <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's pretty well. I don't think it's so bad. Yeah. I, yeah. I get it logically, you know, same thing. Yeah. I, I get it logically that, you know, if we spend our lives kind of, you know, in this bubble of, oh, everything's wonderful and it's all going to be yeah. good and perhaps we're denying the reality. But by the same token, yeah. I think when it comes to resilience and yeah. getting you through the tough times, I, I yep. personally think my optimism has held me in very good <laughs> It served as well. There you go, you and I together (laughs) amongst the Pollyannas. That's good to know there's another one. It's good to know Alan, I'm not the only one. (laughs) Okay, so you went and did the Masters. So it's the Masters in Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne, which is really interesting because I think it's a, for those of us who have had some connection with the university and that course, we're all like, yeah, yeah, we know exactly what we're talking about. But I've spoken to yeah. so many other people, you know, other psychologists and other people interested in getting into psychology. And I've talked about, you know, the sort of stuff I do. And they're like, you can see their eyes light up and go, well, that's so interesting because it's not what I've traditionally thought of as psychology. You know, so much of psychology yeah. is like this clinical work. Yeah. And so I've mentioned the course and said, oh, you should investigate the Masters in Pos Psych at, at Melbourne Uni. And they're like, oh, I've never heard of it. What is it? I'm like, well, go and Google it. <laughs> go and Google it. So, yeah, for any, and I know I have a lot of both psychologists and, and I think psychology students or, or budding psychologists who listen to the podcast. So, yeah, you know, okay. you have the opportunity. The Masters of Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne really is a, a you know, a forerunner in this work in terms of getting some formal postgrad qualifications. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a fantastic course. I couldn't recommend it, you know, more highly. I get to, to work with the team there as well now uh, at the university. And it's always, I think one of the best things about it is it's, you know, people think they have to have studied psychology to do it. It's not, you know, that qualification doesn't enable you to be a psychologist. That's not what it's about. But we, there's such a fusion of amazing people in the room. Um, you know, within the master's program. So you have a mix of psychologists, educators, you have people that are in 
law, you have people that are in policy, you have people that are in HR, you have people that are in arts. It's such a fusion. So you get to sit in this room and you get to learn with, you know, people from so many different fields that are all there for the same reason and are all passionate about the same thing and bringing it into their worlds and, and to others. And I think that's a really rare and lovely thing. It's mm. a great course. Mm. Yeah, actually sounds very sick. I did the master's in coaching psychology at the University of Sydney. Yeah. And this was before, I, I don't think the Melbourne Uni course even existed. Then I started in 2001 or something yeah, yeah. about a million years ago. So yeah, <laughs> it, it was a very similar experience. You didn't have to be a psych. You didn't have to even have had an undergrad psych degree to get into that particular program at the time. I don't know if it's still the same. Um, yeah. and, and they were all what we'd call adult learners. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> Which can come with its own challenges. <laughs> well, it can, it can. But you know, we, we at least, we, we had careers. I was relatively young for the course. I was only in my yeah. uh, mid twenties, maybe yeah, yeah. late twenties, but yeah, people who had careers and, and from all different parts, but that passion, the passion, both of the, the people running the program, um, yeah. plus the passion of, because one of the things about being an adult learner, you're going back there by choice. This isn't yeah. kind of a, Oh, I have to go to uni cause that's what you do. This is, yeah. I consciously made a decision to choose this program because I'm passionate about the topic and I really want to learn. And it does create a, a really exciting atmosphere, doesn't it? Absolutely. Everyone that's there is there because they want to be there and they've worked hard to get there and that certainly shows through. Yeah. Mm. So tell me a bit about, because you teach wellbeing, motivation and performance to students there at the University of of Melbourne and that doesn't sound like a traditional university subject to me. (laughs) Can you tell us about the the program that you're teaching and, and what you teach? Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm really lucky that it ties in with my work that I get to teach the summer intensive of of the the WMP unit. And it's not a traditional subject, you're right. It sits within the Centre of Positive Psychology. Um, But really the subject is about teaching students about wellbeing and how to acquire the skills to use in their own lives at university, but also beyond university as well. So it's interesting we have Again, a very diverse mix of students uh, do this subject because it's a breadth subject. So there's people from education, arts, people studying commerce. Probably the highest amount of students that I have in in each of my classes are biomed, which is really interesting, so biomed students. And I guess they acknowledge the importance of looking after their own well-being and, you know, going forward if they're going into careers of physician and surgeon just how important it is um, in everywhere but you know we know the mental health statistics with the the medical profession so it's really great that they engage the subject uses a lot of positive psychology applications so we look at things from um, strengths to positive emotions to self-determination theory and it's delivered as an experiential learning approach so it's a really hands-on real life experience so they're not learning content they're actually doing you know mm-hmm. they're engaging in the science um, fully it's often rated the highest um, the best subject at the University of Melbourne which is really exciting for the center of post psych because the students just love doing it you know they report at the end just how fantastic it is and how different it is to other subjects that they've done before and how they'll really use it um, going forward and they start, you know, we start every tutorial with a mindfulness practice, which is they find really interesting at the start too, because imagine 10, 20 years ago thinking at the University of Melbourne, we'd be yeah, doing mindfulness yeah. and tutorials. So I did a commerce degree at the University of Melbourne in the early yeah. 1990s. It was nothing like that. I would have yeah. done that subject if it had Absolutely. We sat yeah. in giant lecture halls with like, you know, yeah. four or 500 people and, and sat there and listened yeah. to someone talk and show overhead slides. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you can see what the science is you know, has really done for the credibility of things like mindfulness. We now know it's not just a nice thing to do, but we know what the Buddhists have known for a long time through neuroscience that, you know, it's it actually creates structural changes in the brain. So, um, yeah, we do some fantastic things, but it's about setting them up with the skills for well-being, not just through university, but for their lives going forward in, in the profession that they'll enter post-university studies as well. Mm, so it's really an adjunct, I suppose, to to what they're learning perhaps in terms of the content area but hopefully a bit like we're talking about with the kids in schools hopefully helping them to you know by developing these well-being skills it helps them to learn and perhaps engage more in what they're studying and and it's uh, they are skills for life aren't they absolutely I had one student at the end of one of the uh, 
when we finished the summer intensive and she was a very high achieving biomed student whose dream was to become a surgeon and she was so engaged in the content she was just loving it so much she said at the end so I think I'm going to look into studying positive psychology and I was like no no (laughs) maybe don't do that I don't want to be responsible to explaining you know to your parents why you've changed from your surgeon (laughs) but that's how engaged they become and that's that was a huge thing for her to even be considering Mm. because you know, the sacrifice to going to the study she was undertaking and also the work she put in, it just shows the impact that the the field of positive psychology has on people when they experience it. Yeah. Because, yeah, she wanted to know more. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You've really reminded me of the importance of that experiential piece when I'm discussing this stuff with people in workplaces. And interestingly, I, I actually had a group recently we're talking, this is kind of frontline supervisors, and we're we're talking about more work organizational level stuff but part of it is trying to gain more collaboration do a bit more thinking about process improvement and that kind of why why are we doing what we're doing and so Mm -hmm. as part of this um, session that we're running I said right now we're going to go for a walk and they kind of looked at me like I beg your pardon (laughs) and I said you're going to go out there it was a beautiful sunny day it was cold this is actually in Dalesford which is you know glorious spot and I got them just walking around the oval I said just walk and talk just talk I said the science tells us that if you're walking you're more creative you know it's good for your well-being you'll go back to work feeling refreshed and rejuvenated and and ready to go and they did look at me like I was mental but (laughs) I got them doing it (laughs) and you know it's just a good reminder that it is the doing of that is much part of the learning as yeah and the content yeah absolutely it's interesting you say that because in between um my education work I actually went and worked at Mars Chocolate for a little bit in a a marketing role and that was actually where I first came across any positive psychology application because I always used the, the Gallup Strengths Finder with staff. So we, mm-hmm. we focused on strengths a lot. Mm. But my, um, the, the director in the area I worked in, every single meeting he held was a walking meeting. Yeah. So we never sat down. We never yeah. sat in an office. Yeah. It was like, hey, I've got a meeting. You knew to wear good shoes that day, walking shoes. <laughs> and you would go outside into the grounds and you would have that meeting outside. And Looking back, it was just such a clever way to do it. Got mm. people out, but it also gets you perhaps opening up more and talking more genu- genuinely. Yeah. 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 Even really. that walking side by side. I've spoken to a couple of people about that. Just that notion of walking side by side with someone instead of having to sit and talk to them face to face can yeah. just change the dynamic completely in yeah. terms of the kind of conversation that you might have, especially yeah. in the workplace, you know, we're all, uh, uh, this sort of takes us back to talking about the principles. I can only imagine that for school principals, much like any other leader in an organization, you go in there with your leader hat on, with your school principal hat on, and this idea of who I'm supposed to be when I'm being yeah. a principal of a school. And those ideas of ourselves aren't always consistent with being our best selves or being our happiest selves or being our most authentic yeah. selves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big advocate of the walk for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> good. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very good idea. Yeah. So, Andrew, what do you do in terms of wellbeing? I mean, you know all of this and, and you're helping other organisations and, and schools and students to implement this stuff in their lives. What do you do? What are the kind of perhaps the three top tips that you would give that work for you in terms of wellbeing and happiness? Yeah, a uh, really good question. So, I think no matter how how busy you become or how much you've got going on around you, I think for me, knowing your tribe and keeping them close is number one. So, you know, not your family, friends and community, putting effort into those things and ensuring that they are coming first is most important. Um, I read a fantastic book a number of years ago in Praise of Slow by Carl yeah, Hanor yes. and he talks about, you know, the most important things in life um, things like family, friendships and communities thrive on the one thing that we never have enough of and that's time. So no matter how busy I am, I always just I remember that and yep. I think the more that you put into that, the more that comes back as well. Yep. Also, I'm really big on that aspect of eudaimonia, so cultivating meaning and purpose. So I think engaging in what you love, whether it's a hobby or even in the smallest component or whether you're fortunate enough to do what you love doing every day at work, you need to focus on that and, and never stop doing those things you love because you're too busy or because we get older or because we don't think we should be doing it. I think, you know, making sure that we keep things meaningful and, mm. and purposeful is really important. And then I also think that one thing for me, you know, through 
significant times of adversity that I've always kept really close is that notion of, of hope and awareness. Um, that things will always get better. So cultivating hope. And I always reflect on um, my favorite definition of mindfulness by um, James Baraz. And he said that mindfulness is simply being aware of what is happening right now without wishing it were different, enjoying the pleasant without holding on when it changes, which it will, and being with the unpleasant without always fearing it will be this way, which it won't. So as hard as that first sentence is, you know, enjoying the pleasant or the unpleasant without wishing it were different that can be really hard when you're going through adversity Mm. but knowing that you know the single most important thing I believe for having a optimistic future outlook on life is really that notion of hope followed by spirituality I think they're really important and I think that sometimes is what's lacking not only in young people's lives but also in adults so Mm. yeah having having hope and cultivating that is really important as well. Yeah, hope hope is something I've been thinking about a bit of late too and and the notion of hope as being kind of agency and pathway. So the belief that we can move forward into that kind of more positive future um, and and the self-belief that we can do, which we call agency, and then actually seeing the pathway to do so. Um, yeah. which I find fascinating. And, and I don't know if that's really, to me, it became just such a more, a more meaningful way of thinking about hope than just this kind of abstract, well, yeah, yeah I hope this, you know, turns out okay. You know, really yeah. uh, being able to see a path to making it turn out okay and a self-belief that, you know, you have the power to do that. Absolutely. And Rachel Collar from the University of Melbourne is doing some amazing work in her PhD in this space at the moment, looking at hope through a system lens as well and taking Shane Lopez's work um, even further on hope theory. So that'll be one to watch as well. Mm. She's doing mm. some great work in this space and, and also with, with students too in Hope Lab programs. Maybe someone to get on the podcast to talk about hope. I was just thinking, yes, yes, I was saying that. Absolutely. Don't hope. Okay. Rachel would be a fantastic one. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Andrea, thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us. I've, I've loved this conversation. It's been a whole lot of fun and I can see lots of parallels between what you're doing and, and what I do with, you know, in organizations around really trying to cultivate this experience experience of positive psychology to make it meaningful to people so that it then has that flow on effect to the other people around them. So I really appreciate you sharing all of that with us and also your wellbeing tips. And I will pop all of those details. I'll also make a link to the video of your principles in Indonesia and to the books that you've mentioned. And also where can our audience find you and find out more about Project Thrive? So we have a, a website, projectdrive.com.au, um, that they can link in there, but also on any social media platforms as well. We're Project Thrive at AU, or I can be found on Twitter too under Downey Andrea. Excellent. Okay. I will put all of those details in so that anybody who's interested in finding out more or perhaps making contact with you can do so pretty easily. And thank you, Alan, so much for having me. It's been an honour speaking with you and also hearing about some of your amazing work as well. So keep up the great work. Thank you. I will. Better get back to it now. (laughs) Thank you, Andrea. (laughs) Thanks, Alan. Some really thought-provoking stuff there from Andrea Downey from Project Thrive. What do you think of the idea of disrupting education and creating conditions in which kids can find engagement and meaning and purpose in their school days. Sounds pretty exciting to me. If Andrea has inspired you to learn more about positive education, leadership, and creating ecosystems of well-being, you'll find details about Project Thrive and the many resources she has mentioned and recommended in the show notes for this episode. Pop over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast to take a look. There you'll also find our guest profile sheet for Andrea with all of her contact details. Now, the team and I are preparing for season three of the show already, and we'd love to hear from you, our fabulous listener. And I mean literally hear from you. You can now leave us a voice message on the Potential Psychology website. If you head over to potential.com.au forward slash podcast, you'll see a little note on the left-hand side of the page that says, send a voice message. Click or tap on the start recording button and very quickly and easily leave us a voice message from your phone, tablet or computer. No special equipment required. We'd love to know which interview you have enjoyed the most, what you love about the show, any questions that you may have for me or any of our guests, or perhaps a suggestion for a guest, topic or way in which we can make the show even better. 
Keep listening because we might just put you on the air in season three, sharing your voice and your thoughts with the potential psychology audience. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Our next episode is one for the new parents and parents to be. My guest is clinical psychologist and parenting expert Nadine van der Linden. I'll be chatting to Nadine about the psychological transition that we make when we move from non-parent to parent. What are the challenges? Why is it harder for some of us than others? And how can we best prepare ourselves? Much of the focus when you're expecting or a new parent is on the baby and what's best for him or her. But parents and their well-being are just as important. Here's a bit of what Nadine has to say. Maybe what we all need to start thinking about is it's probably the expectations about how we should feel about our lives and where we should be obtaining our satisfaction. You know, there's so much focus on performance and achievement and being the best. And there can be a lot to be said for just enjoying life and finding things about it that aren't about excellence and performance. Tune in next week to hear more. And thanks for listening.